I'm Rebecca Larson, and this is my Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Welcome to the show. There are things that we take for granted because we've simply always had them. For instance, plumbing, running water, cars, the internet, smartphones, and the list goes on and on. Some of us even grew up without some of today's luxuries, and we survived just fine. But in Tudor England, life was much more dangerous than it is now. Imagine not having vaccines and dying from smallpox. Imagine not having a flushing toilet or a shower. Imagine not having a microwave. I'm sure that people in England at this time had a good life. They didn't really have anything like we have today to compare to. Before we dive into this episode, I need to take a minute to talk about the show. So if you're new to the podcast and found me on iTunes, you are missing out on a bunch of episodes that came before I integrated with iTunes. If you're interested in hearing all of them, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tutors Dynasty and click on Posts. I also have a link to them on my website, tutorsdynasty.com, and you will find it in the menu under podcast. If you do find me on iTunes, I'd also love to see some more reviews. Of course, I'd like to see five-star reviews, but you know, I know sometimes not everybody loves what I do, so please just leave a review. The more reviews I get, the higher I will be on the recommendation list for other tutor lovers like yourself. Now, speaking of Patreon, I need to thank a new patron, Christopher O, for joining the gang, and also thank Stacy O for increasing her pledge yet again. Thank you so much, Christopher and Stacy. And of course, I'd also like to thank my existing patrons, Peggy, Diana, Stacy, Christopher, Rachel H, Rachel D, Michelle, Lacey, Diane, Kathy, Christine, Katie, Joy, James, Anne, Azaria, Lisa, Nora, Sarah, Wendy, Mary, Cynthia, Melissa S, Nicole, Mary, Cheryl, Carrie, Heather from the English Renaissance History Podcast, Tanya, Donna, Catherine, Jen, Lara, Megan, Melissa C., and Pat B. If I forgot you, I am so sorry. I do appreciate it. Without all of your support, I would not be able to continue with these podcasts. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. You know what? It's not only my podcast that you support, but you also support my website. All the money that's received from patrons like you goes right back into the show. The cost of running the website and research materials, including some of those hard to find documents. Believe it or not, I do have a full-time day job and this is something that I do in my ever decreasing downtime. Creating this podcast can easily take 15 hours a week between researching, recording, and editing. And it's something that my husband may not be too keen about, but it is my passion and he does support me. He also might not understand why I'm so obsessed with the tutors, but he does support me anyway. He's obsessed with other things that I don't understand either. Now, if you'd like to become a patron of my podcast, you can go to Patreon. Again, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tutors Dynasty and click on Become a Patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can show your support. My website, TutorsDynasty.com, started in June of 2015. So with that in mind, June is my third anniversary. Woohoo! This entire month on Facebook only, I will be giving away a bunch of fun tutor or history themed prizes. Thanks to wonderful authors and friends like Seamus O'Kelly, Samantha Wilcoxon, Wendy J. Dunn, Natalia Richards, Janet Werbin, Leanda Delisle, Tony Riches, Kira Kramer, Claire Ridgway, Heather Tesco, Adrian Dillard, Judith Arnop, Anne Barnhill, Paula Lofting, Nathan Amin, and Matthew Lewis. Now, we've already given away quite a few prizes, um, but we still got about half a month to go. So make sure that you're checking my Facebook page every day and going through um, the registration process. Each day, I try to make it a little bit different. Um, There will be a link on my Facebook page that um, will refer you to the website where you will see three steps that you have to complete in order to be registered. It's just that easy. And then I have Siri on my wonderful iPhone help pick a number one through however many registrations we have. And then we randomly come up with a winner. That is the only way I was able to make this completely fair. 
So with all that fun, let's get on with the show. So sit back, relax, and prepare to be transported back in time to Tudor, England. The reality of the lives of Tudor women varied due to their social ranks, their marital status, where they lived, and even their religious affiliations. Regardless of all the aforementioned things, all women were discriminated against due to their gender. This is something that, to some extent, still rings true today. Here are some things that the modern-day woman takes for granted. In Tudor England, women could not hold public office. Women could not vote. Women were barred from attending grammar schools and universities. And women could not be stage actors. Their male counterparts would play the roles of women in their plays. However, women of noble birth could receive a formal education when their families paid for tutors. Those who were not of noble birth were often educated by either their mother or a parish priest. Tudor women often found themselves defined by their husbands and were generally categorized as maids, wives, and widows. If they deviated from the social norm, they would often be called a shrew, a scold, whore, or even a witch. A woman's virtue was her most prized possession. In the Elizabethan era, women began to really venture into print, sharing their thoughts and criticisms. This was not seen as compatible with the standard of women having modesty and being considered virtuous. I found information about punishment of women in an article by Kelly Marshall in the magazine called The Week. So here I'm going to list and quote uh, Miss Marshall um, about the different punishments that women went through. Neighbors often dealt with shrews themselves to evade the law, and yes, being a scold was illegal. The community would stage a chivalry, also known as rough music, a skimmington, and carding. Changing pots and pans, townspeople would gather in the streets, their music drawing attention to the offending scold, who often rode backwards on a horse or mule. She faced the wrong way to symbolize the transgressive reversal of gender roles. Another punishment was the cucking stool. Elizabethan women who spoke their minds and sounded off too loudly were also punished via a form of waterboarding. A cucking or ducking stool featured a long wooden beam with a chair attached to one end. The beam was mounted to a seesaw, allowing the shackled skull to be dunked repeatedly in the water. The action would supposedly cool her off. A third device used to control women and their speech during Shakespeare's day was the scold's bridle, or brank. Resembling a horse's bridle, this contraption was basically just a metal cage placed over the scold's head. A plate inserted into the woman's mouth forced down her tongue to prevent her from speaking. Like women who suffered through chivalry and cucking stools, women squeezed into the branks were usually paraded through town. In fact, some scolds bridles, like the one we previously listed, included ropes and chains so that the husband could lead her through the village or she him. Some branks featured decorative elements like paint, feathers, or a bell to alert others of her impending presence. Furthermore, some of the mouthpieces contained spikes to ensure that the woman's tongue was really tamed. Now we're going to move on to childbirth in Tudor England. Once married, it was imperative for a Tudor bride to produce a male heir for her husband. But let's be honest, sometimes the woman would be pregnant prior to the wedding. Nowadays, we can take an at-home pregnancy test to find out if we're pregnant. In Tudor times, women didn't have that luxury. If a woman missed her period, she could assume she was with child, but could not truly confirm it until she felt the child move inside her. This was referred to as the quickening. The quickening generally happened around the fourth month of pregnancy, and by then she would have already experienced tender breasts, cravings, and quite possibly a swollen stomach. On an interesting side note, up until the 19th century, or let's say the 1800s, the quickening was believed to be the point at which the child received its soul. Historian Dr. Susan Walter Schmidt points out that in the 16th century, pregnancy was not as dangerous as modern writers have portrayed. 
She states that in England, there was about a 1% chance of a woman dying during each of her pregnancies and a 5 to 7% chance that she would die from pregnancy in her lifetime. This is quite different from what we've been led to believe. With that being said, pregnancy in Tudor England was not taken lightly. Even with the small percentages of death from childbirth, it is believed that most Tudor women would have known someone who had died this way. Miscarriage was a common occurrence of the time. About half of all pregnancies resulted in miscarriage. This would have been undoubtedly a stressful time once a woman had discovered that she was with child. In today's world, a mother is instructed to take prenatal vitamins, to eat healthy, to avoid raw meats, and a list of other harmful food items. Tudor women were instructed to restrain from physical activities, to abstain from sex, eat well, and to use herbal remedies when needed. The sex of the child could not have been determined by an ultrasound. However, some consulted with an astrologer to discover the sex of their child. As we already know from the birth of Elizabeth Tudor to Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, astrologers were often wrong. It was also believed in the Tudor era that birthmarks and birth defects were caused by the woman witnessing or being involved in a traumatic event. Nowadays, some truly believe that a birthmark is something that's left over from a past life, or even a mark to signify how you had died. Both are interesting theories. While women of noble birth would receive a more formal education, they would not experience childbirth that was much different from their counterparts. As a woman's due date would approach, the woman would choose women she wanted near her for the childbirth. Men, very rarely, if at all, were allowed in the room. If the woman lived in a town or a village, she may have been able to have a trained midwife present for the birth, while the country woman would have had a woman who was just experienced in childbirth. Another interesting side note, male midwives were not allowed into the birthing chamber until the following century. When the time had arrived, the woman's bed would have been stripped and made with clean linens. She would also have a clean shift to wear. Often, fresh air was seen as harmful to the mother and child, so the windows would be closed and the curtains drawn. This was meant to create a warm and comfortable environment for the child that was similar to that of the mother's womb. When she was in full labor and it was time to push, her position would vary. Sometimes a birthing stool would be used. And if you haven't seen a birthing stool, it's essentially a chair with a large opening in the middle to allow the midwife or the woman who was delivering the child to catch the child. Other than the birthing stool, the positions were very similar to what we experience today, propped up in a bed and other positions to help the process. I will spare you all the details. Immediately after the birth, the child would be washed and wrapped while the mother was taken care of by other women present. If a midwife was present and the child appeared to be of poor health and deemed not to live long, the midwife would baptize the child right there. Historian Dr. Susan Walter Schmidt admits that most of what is known about 16th century childbirth is inferred from a small number of sources and information we have for slightly later times. This is mainly because the women who were involved in the process would rarely be able to read or write. On rare occasion, you can find something written in a diary or a letter. Now, marriage was an important milestone because it signified adulthood for the bride and groom. The average age of the average Tudor man entering marriage is a bit higher than you may imagine, 27, while his female counterpart would have been about 24 years old. The upper class was a bit younger by a few years when they entered into wedlock. In addition, anyone marrying under the age of 21 required permission from their parent or guardian to marry. Most parents among the peerage and gentry arranged their children's marriages. The bride's parents were also expected to provide a dowry. If you're unfamiliar with dowries, they were money and sometimes land or property that was given to the husband upon marriage to their daughter. Prior to a wedding, the marriage bans were announced at the parish church on three consecutive Sundays. This occurred to allow time prior to the ceremony to uncover any impediments to the marriage. Sometimes it would even be discovered that the couple were too closely related and so the wedding would not occur. 
The actual ceremony is much like today's with an exchange of rings, and instead of a marriage license, the marriage was just marked in the parish registry. Now, moving on to something a little bit more fun, we're going to look into the fairs and markets of the Tudor time. Now, fairs and markets in Tudor England allowed both citizens and producers to come together to buy and sell goods. Fairs were either annual or biannual events, and they brought in both buyers and sellers from larger areas than, say, a market did. The products offered at fairs would have been things such as sheep, horses, cattle, leather, and cloth. It wasn't just purchasing and selling items that occurred at fairs, but there was also entertainment. Unlike fairs of today, with carnival rides and deliciously fattening foods, there would have been jugglers, fire eaters, tumblers, and other types of entertainments. Markets, on the other hand, were more frequent than fairs, happening weekly and all over England. At the beginning of Henry VIII's reign, there were over 750 towns in England that held markets. It was at these markets that citizens could purchase necessary supplies like produce, fish, grain, and other products. The thing that I hear most from my social media followers is that they, or you, want to hear more about everyday Tudor life. This is definitely not a specialty of mine as I tend to look closer at personal relationships and how they intertwine into the story of Tudor history. Now, the average person in England essentially worked from sunrise to sunset. They were occupied in trade, in agriculture or farming, or they produced some type of product. Then there were landowners, because not everyone owned their own land, remember? If you were a landowner in Tudor England, you served in some aspect in government, you were responsible for running your estates, and a multitude of other responsibilities. Some responsibilities were, of course, also delegated. As with today, we all have to find time to do something other than work. This was much the same in the 16th century. Hunting was a very popular pastime for those of the peerage and gentry, and of course, the royals as well. The wealthy were the ones who were lucky enough to hunt deer. If you were, say, the keeper of the forest for the king, you had to get a license from him before you could hunt deer within the forest. On the flip side, the yeoman farmer were allowed to hunt foxes, while the poor could only hunt rabbits and hares. Quite a difference in diet, eh? There is also a wide selection of outdoor activities, such as football or soccer, depending on what part of the world you live in. Football in Tudor England was different than today. The teams were made of as many people who wanted to play, and the goals were a mile apart. Another big difference is that the participants could not only kick the ball, but they could also pick it up and throw it. I read somewhere once that when Native Americans played lacrosse, that sometimes their goals were six miles apart, and participants would really need to have to build up some endurance and stamina. Imagine the amount of calories you would burn. There were other outdoor activities as well. Some of the upper class also played archery and fencing. There were also games called Blindman's Bluff and Hoodman's Blind. Ever heard of them? Yeah, me neither. These games are described as having one person blindfolded, and that person must either identify or catch the people who are touching them or hitting them. It sounds like a miserable version of tag, if you ask me. There were also games called Bowls. This was a game that was very similar to what we know as bowling with the ten pins and ball. A sport that we know Henry VIII excelled at was tennis. If you've ever watched the Tudor series, you'll remember the scenes where Henry would play tennis with his friends while others watched on. Tennis is believed to be one of the oldest sports that uses a racket. Again, if you watch the Tudors, you'll recall how the game was played indoors. Much like today, it also had a net that the players would hit the ball over. In Tudor England, the participants were also allowed to bounce the ball off the walls. Now this kind of sounds like racquetball to me. And then they would score points when they got the leather ball into the goal that was high on the wall. Now this sounds really like an interesting version of tennis or racquetball, but I really want to go play it now. The lower classes could enjoy things like wrestling, swimming, if they knew how to, and horseback riding. In the Elizabethan era, billiards was introduced and became a popular pastime of the upper class. 
This was also the time when theater became a source of entertainment. Have you heard of that guy called Shakespeare? That's so. It wasn't all outdoor activities. There was plenty to do inside as well, such as a friendly game of chess, checkers, dice, and of course, card games. Most of these indoor games also included gambling, something that we know that Henry VIII, Anne Boleyn, and Queen Mary I greatly enjoyed. While this wasn't necessarily a list of activities or entertainment for the lower class, it does give you a sense of how Tudor England let loose. I forgot to mention some of the more scandalous entertainment from Tudor England, something that today we would very much frown upon, such as bear baiting. Now this just sounds horrible to watch, but was considered appropriate entertainment for the time. A bear would be chained to a post and it was within a ring. Then a bunch of dogs were allowed inside the ring to try and kill the bear. Ugh, no thanks, I will pass. But Henry VIII and Elizabeth both enjoyed the sport. There was apparently a ring at Whitehall Palace so that they can watch it from their windows. It truly was a different time. Then there was also cockfighting, which is considered an ancient spectator sport with origins in India, China, and Persia, as well as other Eastern civilizations. It was introduced to ancient Greece sometime around 524 BC, and it consisted of putting two cocks, or roosters, together in a ring. By instinct, the two will fight to the death for dominance. That doesn't sound like much fun to watch either. And on an interesting side note, it was important to the Tudor government that people spent most of their time working. A law was passed in 1512 that banned ordinary people from a whole range of games, including tennis, dice, cards, bowls, and skittles. Mm, that sounds like the candy. <laughs> now, the average life in Tudor England was not easy. A large number of residents lived in the country with a large percentage of people living in small villages. They made their living by farming and selling goods at markets or to others. And the average life expectancy would have been around 35 years old. When we think about all the modern conveniences that we have today, like the plumbing, running water, clean water, motor vehicles, electricity, the list goes on. The comforts we take for granted would have all been well appreciated in Tudor England. People often drank ale, which is different than the beer that we know today because of how it was made. Now they drank ale because water was collected from pumps and wells and streams and was usually contaminated. Hell, they used to dump sewage in the Thames, so I'm pretty sure you wouldn't want to drink that water. Now milk wasn't really used for simply drinking as it was only available around the times that the cows calved and was too useful in making cheese and butter for any to be left over for drinking. And the first flushing toilets weren't introduced in England until Sir John Harrington invented it in Elizabethan era. This is why today some still refer to it as the John. The toilet or toilet room was often called a privy or privy chamber. The setup was generally a piece of wood over a hole similar to an outhouse, maybe. In castles, the excrement would just run down the side of the building into a pile, and then some poor soul would be responsible to cart it off someplace else. Now, here's a weird thought, but I wonder if they used it as fertilizer, much like farmers of today use animal excrement on their fields as fertilizer. Sorry, that got gross there. <laughs> Have you ever wondered what they wiped their bum with? If you were the King of England, you would have a groom of the stool wipe you with a cloth and dispose of everything for you. Now this was a prized position at Tudor court because it brought you close to the king and you could ask for favors. If by chance you were not the King of England, then you would wipe with lamb's wool or if that wasn't available, then you could use leaves and moss in its place. In Tudor England, the people ate a lot of fresh food. They didn't have refrigerators or freezers to store food like we do today. They were able to preserve some of it with salt, but I'm not sure how long that would have lasted before going bad. Meals were eaten with fingers as forks were not commonplace at the time. They did exist, but they just weren't being used. However, they did use knives and spoons. 
Animals were kept year-round for the sole purpose of having meat available when you needed it, and the meat would be fresh. A large majority, possibly 75% of the wealthy, had a diet made of meat. It would be oxen, deer, calves, pigs, badgers, and wild boar. This would have made up a large portion of their diets. If you were Henry VIII, you might have eaten all of those in one meal. They also ate birds, like peacock, pheasant, crane, chicken, and even pigeons. Bread was a very important staple in Tudor England, with it being eaten at most meals. And if you were wealthy, you would eat white bread made of whole flour. But if you were poor, your bread would be made of rye or even ground acorns. As we know, fruits and vegetables are important to diets to prevent scurvy and other diseases. And in England, they made sure to get some beans, peas, carrots, parsnips, peas in a pod, cabbages, cauliflower, leeks, and onions. Now, mind you, potatoes didn't come into England until the late 16th century. Or they would also eat fruits that were in season like apples, pears, cherries, and plums. They could preserve some of the fruit and syrup to make it last longer through the winter months. Fish was definitely commonplace near rivers and coastal towns for a source of protein. They would eat freshwater fish like salmon, eels, pike, perch, trout, and sturgeon. Every Friday, it was required that people ate fish, not just lint. So it was an important staple in their diet. Poor people ate a lot of pottage. It was an herb-flavored soup, sometimes made with peas, milk, egg yolk, parsley, and breadcrumbs, and was flavored with saffron and ginger, while others have said it was a mix of grains, water, and vegetables with meat scraps. It was often served with bread made from rye or ground acorns. Chicken was also a staple for the lower classes as they were more affordable to raise and then eat. If they could afford it, they would buy meat from one of the weekly markets. They could also hunt hares and rabbits. So that was just a few examples of what Tudor life in England was like. I do have many more categories to discuss on this topic, so this will be at least a two-part series, if not three. Thank you so much for joining me again this week. My name is Rebecca Larson, signing off from the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Until next time.